He asked if they were well, and he said, How is your elderly father that you have told me about? Is he still alive? They answered, Your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. And they bowed down to honor him. Mm -hmm. When he looked up and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, he asked, Is this your youngest brother that you told me about? Then he said, May God be gracious to you, my son. Joseph hurried out because he was overcome with emotion for his brother, and he was about to weep. He went into an inner room to weep. Then he washed his face and came out. Regaining his composure, he said, serve the meal. Okay, now this is not a great parallel, but John was considered, if anybody has heard of the apostles and their ages, Throughout church history, John has always been considered the youngest apostle. As a matter of fact, a lot of pictures show him almost like a girl. He just a very feminine figure, uh, facial features almost in all of the, the artwork that's done of him because he was so young. And that is the one that Jesus, he's the beloved apostle of Jesus. And you, you know, you'll see that term used of John several times. Well, it's the same thing as Benjamin here. The youngest being the one that has the heart of Joseph. It's not a perfect parallel, but it is an interesting parallel that John is the one that, and he also survived the longest out of all of them because, uh, uh, you know, the rest of them were martyred or they went off somewhere and died or whatever. But John was, uh, gee, 92 or 95 or something when he wrote the book of Revelation. And that was after having been boiled in oil and also served in Patmos, you know, in prison there. So, I mean, the guy had a long life, but um, just a kind of interesting parallel about John and James. Remember when they came up to Jesus and they said, um, we, want, we want you to do whatever we ask for you. And uh, uh, Jesus said, what is it? And he says, we want one of us to sit on your right hand and one of you to sit on your left hand in your kingdom. And he says, that's not for me to grant. That's for the place prepared. But in a way, it was fulfilled literally. Okay, Because James was the first of the apostles martyred and John was the last one to die. And so you do have a parallel in there. Jesus was granted one, the first, and one to be, you know, the last one received up. So anyway, kind of a good parallel, but just an interesting thing about the two of them. Okay, go ahead. They served him by himself, his brothers by themselves, and the Egyptians who were eating with him by themselves, because Egyptians could not eat with Hebrews, since that is the point. Right, and we're going to see that again later when Israel and, and all of them move up there. We're going to see the same terminology. And the reason why, not only because they don't want to eat with Hebrews or a lower class or whatever, but they're shepherders. And that's specifically the Egyptians really, it would be like us looking down on garbage men or something. You know, oh, he's a garbage man. You know, we don't want to even... Good the what? They get paid pretty good. Yeah, they do. <laughs> Gee whiz. I take out the garbage every day. I clean toilets. So I don't care. But, you know, I'm just saying that would be like somebody's idea here in America. Is, oh, they're shepherders and they're just considered like an abomination. Well, that's why he's not even sitting with them. Wow. But it says because they're Hebrews, later we're going to find out that's a little more specific about why. They were seated before him in order by age, from the firstborn to the youngest. The men looked at each other in astonishment. You think they might have started the clue in, but they didn't. They're like, how did he know? We're all in. You know, there's 12 of them, and certainly some look old. I, everybody says that I look the oldest of my, my two brothers and I. And then they say that my oldest brother looks the middle and that my middle brother looks the youngest. Everybody says that. Well, I got a beard. And, you know, how do you tell? Once you get up to a certain age and you're all very close in age, but he had them all sitting in order. So, you know, no light, no light bulb has gone on in their head. It's just kind of cute. <laughs> portions were served to them from jo Joseph's table, and Benjamin's portion was five times yeah. larger than any of theirs. Yeah. They drank and they got drunk with Joseph. Mm -hmm. Then Joseph commanded his steward, fill the men's bag with as much food as they can carry, and put each one's money on at the top of his bag. Now, i got to tell you, there is something about the five times. There's a parallel, yeah. and I can't remember it right now, and I'm going to think it over, and I'll, I'll let you know. I, it, it's been a while since I read that, but there is a parallel, him getting five times as much and something else in the Bible, which is an interesting parallel. Anyway, as I, I think I said, maybe it was in the Saturday night class, but the number five, anybody know what the significance of the number five in the Bible is? Grace. grace. It's a number of grace. So you see number six is a number of man, the number seven is a number of completion, number 40 is testing, but the, when you see the number five, it's usually grace. And grace is being heaped up on him. 
being the younger brother and the favorite brother, he's getting this extra portion. Anyway, so if you see the number five, it generally is signifying grace. But there's a wonderful parallel that I'm just not remembering right now. So, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Put my cup, the silver one, at the top of the youngest one's bag along with his grain money. So he did as Joseph told him. At morning light, the men were sent off with their donkeys. They had not gone very far from the city when Joseph said to the, sh the steward, Get up, pursue the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Mm. Isn't the cup that my master drinks from and uses for, how my word is, divination? What have you done? What you have done is wrong. When he overtook them, he said these words to them. They said to him, Why does my Lord say these things? Your servant, servants could not possibly do such a thing. We even brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money we found at the top of our bags. How could we steal gold and silver from your master's house? Mm -hmm. If any of us is found to have it, he must die, and we will also will become my Lord's slaves. Now, why did Joseph do this? I'm sure you already know, but make sure we understand. Why did Joseph do this? Why did he put the cup in the sack and have him go after him? It's in Benjamin's sack, isn't it? It's in Benjamin's sack. Yeah. So why? So he would be the one that would be in trouble. In trouble, and then yes. father would be coming down or something? Well, yes, but remember that he was the one that was betrayed 20-some years earlier, and he is testing his brothers. He's, he's putting a test on them to see if they have changed their ways. Benjamin's life is now forfeit. The last time... They got away with it. And so he is doing this, planning in advance to make. He hasn't revealed himself to his brothers yet, right? And so well, obviously. I don't understand why they don't recognize him. Well, you got to figure. They well, probably shaved off all of his hair. He's wearing those Egyptian, you know how they paint their faces and they wear that, that thing over them? Any leader in Egypt would. He would have been really indistinguishable. Plus, he's not speaking in Hebrew, he's speaking in Egyptian <coughs> to them. So they would never imagine that this was their brother. But. They, he, he was betrayed by them, and he is really testing their faith before he reveals himself. Because if they do the same thing to Benjamin that he's done to him, he certainly would never have revealed himself to him, ever. Benjamin has certainly been spoiled, pampered. Family, oh, yes. And they could have learned The same animosity. That's right. That's exa exactly. And there's no doubt he's the favored son. I mean, Israel has said this, even though... Joseph doesn't know it. Israel has told the brothers, so... I only have one left. <laughs> I only have one left. The rest of you don't matter, but Benjamin does. So, I mean, that's why he's doing this, is he is setting them up to test them. You know, and it's no different than the Lord testing our hearts. And as I said, when, when a test comes, the Lord already knows what's going to happen. He does it for our benefit, not for His. Anytime you... It's like it says, um, do not be afraid... Uh, do not... Be afraid to entertain strangers because at some, in doing so, some have entertained angels unaware. I know that's a misquote. In other words, the angels aren't being sent for God to know whether we're going to attend to those angels or not. Those are being sent, one, to demonstrate in the future that we either failed or passed the test, and two, it's so that we can understand something about ourselves. God already knows everything about us. But if he sends an angel and we have no idea that this is an angel, he's doing it for our benefit. And afterward, you know, you hear about somebody uh, picking somebody up, you know, helping them out, and later they disappear. Never hear from them again. Or somebody comes out and, and uh, uh, you know, saves somebody. I, 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 somebody dragged me up the shore and then he... No doubt angels are out there. I firmly believe it. The Bible says it, and I believe that. I don't believe in angelic visitations, though, where an angel comes and sits and have coffee with somebody and they talk about future events. I, I, I don't believe that. If you do, we're just going to disagree because I do not believe that angels come and speak to people and reveal things anymore. We have God's Word, and that's what we have. But um, I do believe that angels participate in the stream of humanity to affect God's purposes in many ways, and sometimes we know it, and sometimes we don't, and sometimes we just are sure of it without ever being positive. You know what I mean? I can't believe it. I picked this guy up. I gave him twenty dollars, and and 
I'm sure he was an angel. Something happened to, to clue you in, but you can never prove it. But that's what Paul is saying, or whoever wrote Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 13. But once again, that, that's what's going on here, is he's testing these people in the way that Jesus would test us. The difference is that Jesus already knows. Joseph doesn't. All right, go ahead. We must die, and we also will become my Lord's slave. The steward replied, what, have, what you have said is proper, but only the one who is found to have it will be my slave, and the rest of you will be bound. Okay, so they've all said that we're all, we're all guilty if it happens. But the, the steward says, no, only one of you is going to be guilty. So not only, Joseph already knew that this was going to be the outcome. They'd all make an oath and, oh, you can't do this. But in the end, is it going to be his neck against theirs? Instead of it being all their necks, he says, no. It, it, so that's what we're facing now. Are they going to be faithful to their brother or are they going to say, whew, we got away with that one? All right, go ahead. So each one quickly lowered his sack to the ground and opened it. The steward searched, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest. Cup was found in Benjamin's sack. So he even told him, you start with the oldest. You know, I, there's no doubt he had it all planned out. No, it's not me. No, it's not me. And they all think by the time they get to Benjamin, Benjamin didn't do it. There's no way he'd do that. You know how you... He's the good kid. Yeah. Oh, boy. All right. So Benjamin's guilty. Then they tore their clothes and each one loaded his donkey and returned to the city. When Judah and his brothers reached Joseph's house, he was still there. They fell to the ground before him. What is this you have done, Joseph said to them. Don't you know that a man like me could uncover the truth by divination? How do you say that? Divination. Divination. Now, you know, the Bible forbids divination, but that's in the law. It doesn't say that before the law. So I'm not saying that it was okay by any stretch of the imagination. But in the law of Moses, it says a, a person that practices divination or a sorcerer or anything like that is to be cut off from his people or killed. All right. In this context, people always say, well, you know, uh, it wasn't right for Joseph to have a cup to practice divination. That's before the law. We can't insert something from the law to before the law. Now, whether he actually did that or not, we have no idea. He could have just said, I do this thing. Just so his brothers think, oh, you know, I can practice divination. But once again, don't insert the law where the law doesn't belong. The law came at the time of Moses. What were you going to ask? No, that's you answered. Oh, okay. Because the cup of divination was mentioned in verse 5. I right. put a question mark there in one of my readings. And then again, uh, in the sentence, but you answered. Right. Okay, good. I'm glad. I preempted you. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, yes. Our footnote says, did Joseph really practice divination? Probably not. Right. He would have no desire or need to. Because of his relationship with, with God. God. Absolutely. Um, this statement was probably part of the test to emphasize how important the cup was. That's right. And I would totally agree with that analysis. If the commentary, any of you have a commentary that says this was forbidden under blah, 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 and people do that all the time in, in biblical commentaries, you can't do that. You simply can't insert the law where the law doesn't belong. And the law hadn't come about until the time of Moses, three more generations later. So, but I can't tell you how many commentaries I've read that do that. Oh, well, this was against the Leveret Law, or this was against this part of the Mosaic Law. Or, sorry, you know what? That didn't exist at the time. So, but I, I like that analysis there. Very well said. Okay, go ahead. What can we say to my Lord? How can we plead? How can we justify ourselves? God has exposed your servants. Mm. We are now my Lord's slave. Both we and the one in whose possession the cup was found. Then Joseph said, I swear that I will not do this. The man in whose possession the cup was found will be my slave. The rest of you can go in peace to your father. Okay, so here we are. We're in the same position. They, they're trying to get out of it by saying we're all guilty. Okay, and... He repeats what the, the servant said back up when he got to their donkeys. Oh, no, 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 no. Just this one. Just, and so he's really putting them under a test now, just as he was 20-some years ago. And they failed the test then. So what's going to happen? Oh, it's, it's so perfectly executed. This entire account is just, it's just beautiful. Go ahead. Benjamin doesn't seem to be protesting. He can't. I mean, it's in his thing. What's he going to yeah. do? I, you know, he can say I didn't do it, but it wouldn't make any difference. It was in his sack. So, you know, he could say it was put there. Well, if he was to accuse them of doing that, that would be his life anyway. 